hope everyone is fine. I'm recording the meeting just for everyone to know. Thank you very much for joining us here um, to our third, I think, the third Paula Cantor seminar series um, where we share, colleagues share their ongoing uh, research uh, on gender equity and social inclusion aspects um, of, of their work at CIMIT. And we're very pleased to have these sessions um, accompanied um, by our colleague Agnes Kuisimping from IFPRI. She's a senior scientist at, at IFPRI and she is very, if you have read her work, you will notice she's very experienced and very knowledgeable in dealing with uh, yeah, JC research in the agri-food system. And um, we're glad to have her here and she will act as discussant in these type of events. So we will hear, uh, usually we hear an input uh, from one of our colleagues, Simit, and then there will be some discussion uh, led by, or some comments by Agnes, and then afterwards we have an open session for Q&A. And today I'm very glad uh, that we have a presentation from our colleague Monica Fischer, who's a senior scientist, uh, also agricultural economist, uh, based in our office in Nairobi. And she will present us um, ongoing work uh, on bridging the digital divides and empowering farmers to diffuse climate smart agricultural practices in Zambia. So thank you very much, Monica. I hand over the floor to you and just indicate me when you want me to move the slides. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Agnes, for um, your strong participation in this, in this seminar series. Um, so I apologize for the delay in getting started and I'll just get straight to it. So um, what I'm gonna be do presenting in this seminar is um, our CIMIT team's design journey and initial research fund findings. This is for a USAID funded project um, that we've carried out in Zambia in the last year and a half. Um, and as part of that project, what we've done is we've developed a hybrid advisory platform that includes both digital and in-person channels. Um, and as the title says, it's this is for the purpose of diffusing climate smart agricultural practices to smallholder farmers. So I, I'm presenting on behalf of a, a, you know, a very, very strong and um, diverse team. Their names are, are listed here. And I think um, many of them are, are um, part of the presentation today. So, or they're, they're in this, the webinar. So if we have questions, um, they also um, will be able to help us respond to some of those. All right, so you see the photo at the left. Okay, and that's what we aspire to in this project. Ultimately, what we hope is that farmers, like the lady pictured here, will recognize the significant value of digital advisory services such that they'll spontaneously take a break from their farm work and call in. So this, po this was posed, a posed photo, but this is one of our beneficiary farmers. And this is really what we hope is that if she's in the middle of farming and she has a question, she'll call in to our digital advisory service um, to um, get an answer to her question or to share feedback um, or share her knowledge with other farmers. So in order to achieve what we aspire to takes a lot. So in the title, we mentioned bridging digital access divides, which is really, really important. Um, and also we want to enable farmers to actively participate in um, and inf influence the project um, because without that, without empowering these farmers and actively involving them, then we're not going to ensure broad access. There won't be trust in the system and the services won't be relevant. So um, that's where the, the title comes. Next slide, please. All right, so as Michael said, this is an ongoing study. So it's two years in Zambia and um, we're doing three things. One is designing this um, advisory platform, testing it. And the testing is done largely through um, farmer users and evaluating. So we do have um, some quantitative and qualitative analysis that are part of this. Um, and our goal is, as I said before, is to have an inclusive, advisory platform for climate smart agricultural practices. So we have two channels 
two types of channels. One is digital. We're using a mobile phone, as you see um, the woman farmer um, top right. So basic, we're using a basic mobile phone, something that farmers have at their fingertips right now. Um, and then we also were supplementing it with um, in-person uh, advisory because that that's an approach that you know is tried and trusted over over very many years. So um, we do have a name to our platform um, thanks to the team. It's Atubandike, which means let's chat in um, a Zambian language, Tonga. The number of farmers that we're engaging here directly is 4,000 farmers, 50% of whom are women. We also engage village-based digital champions, um, and these are 50% women and largely youth. Uh, and they play a really, really important role, as do farmers, in our project. And we're also engaging community members. So at a recent focus group discussion, um, as part of a community engagement activity, we had more than 1,700 community members, like this young man at the bottom right. So as I said, three phases to the study, and that's what I'll be talking about today in addition to a little bit of motivation. So the three phases to the study are design, and that's both design of the digital um, and in-person platform, as well as research design. And then at the end of that phase, we had a prototype um, advisory platform that I'll share with you. And then stage two was understanding needs, testing, and iteration. Now, Understanding needs, obviously, that came in step one, but the more rigorous version of that came in step two when we did a baseline study. And then the testing is the user testing that I'll talk about. And then that through through what we learned, we then iterated to the next version of our advisory platform. And finally, finally we're setting up um, the what is needed for us to monitor and um, conduct rigorous impact assessment. Next slide, please. There we go. All right, so this project is motivated by a cautious optimism. And so let's start with the optimism, okay? So the reasons we're optimistic is, first of all, as we, we know, mobile phones, especially the basic ones, not so much the smart ones, are increasingly owned and used by diverse farmers in Africa. So Michael, can we quickly go to the next slide? And then we're gonna... Okay, so this is um, data. It's a little bit outdated. I was trying to get um, something newer, but these trends, um, you know, have have largely continued. This is from the Pew Research Center. So at left, what we see is this huge surge um, in Africa of cell phone ownership. Right, it went from about ten percent in in some of the countries back in two thousand two to in 2014. South Africa approached the cell phone ownership rate of, of the US. And then at right, we see also from the Pew Research Center data that indicates that the majorities across Sub-Saharan Africa, majorities of adults, I should say, own a mobile phone. And, you know, as I said before, basic phones are the most common type. So in we see Tanzania at the bottom. Um, it's you, you can see that only 1% of the um, adult population surveyed owned a smartphone, whereas 62% owned a, uh, a basic phone. Next slide, please. This is also, this is data that I also think shows an aspiration, um, you know, from a social inclusion um, in advisory um, lens which is, this is data from a study by McCampbell et al. 2023, um, their figure six. So it's data from Rwandan smallholder farmers. If I'm remembering right, it was about 600 farmers. And, and it's showing the digital platforms that are used regularly. If we look on the right, we see, you know, very little use of smartphones. On the left, very encouraging, is 81% of females and 78% of males using regularly um, a basic phone. Um, in, in our Zambia case study, we do have a gender gap, um, whereas there isn't one in Rwanda, um, at, at least in this Rwanda sample. Um, and I think in most countries there is a gender gap, but this is something um, to aspire to and it will be important um, to learn from Rwanda. So Michael, can we go back two slides, please? Thanks. All right. 
So the re second reason for optimism is um, we all know that in-person agricultural extension services are really challenged, increasingly so, right? There are a bunch of things that make it really hard to reach person, um, a large number of people in person with um, understaffing, over um, under-resourcing. Um, it's not cost-effective. We also see issues of of timeliness and um, sometimes a lack of personalization of content. So digital advisory can greatly complement and it can help overcome some of the, the challenges that are faced by, by in-person advisory. Finally, I mean, something we, we don't hear as much about when um, you hear about you know, the, um, the possibilities or the potential of, of digital advisory is the inclusiveness features. So one of them is that is flexibility, right? And so like, you know, the, the woman, uh, the woman farmer in the picture, right? She, she can call in, um, assuming she has network, right? And, and has um, a SIM card, of course, and, and a phone. So a lot of assumptions, but there's flexibility in when and where she can access the content to some extent. Right. She doesn't have to show up to an in-person meeting at a certain time um, that might be, um, you know, at a distance. So it helps uh, overcome some of women's time and mobility constraints. Second is um, the possibility for voice based messaging in local languages. Right. So this can help us help reach um, less literate folks and people who don't speak uh, um, English and, and other um other other languages that are not uh, non-local languages. And third, um, women often have um, quite different peer networks. Um, so women farmers will, will probably often talk to, they're more likely to talk to, to kin and more village-based um, networks um, for their, yeah, discussions about farming. Whereas men team, seem tend to have networks that span a wider distance. And, and that gives men an advantage in terms of getting new content. And so with digital approaches, um, this could potentially open up the possibility for people who, who, who tend to you know, be more localized and have um, less diverse and smaller peer networks to have access to, to much wider, more diverse peer networks. All right, so three more, three slides down, please. There we go, thanks. All right, so that was the optimistic part. Okay, what about caution? Okay, so why is caution warranted? Well, I think we we can see there all do we really need another digital advisory tool, right? There are so many advisory tools already in existence. Um Acre et al in a review paper, for example, they they point to 140 ICT for agricultural initiatives just in the last few decades. And in a really nice um, global review, uh, Dittmer et al., um, Dittmer's from SIAT, um, reviewed 61 digital extension tools. There were many more, but they narrowed it down to, they were looking for specific ones that they spoke to social inclusion. But out of all of these, and, and many, many other examples, of course, very few of them represent meaningful social inclusion, although they have tremendous benefits in many other ways. So it is at issue was that I, I think, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're repeating some of the same mistakes of in-person agricultural extension where we're targeting a certain demographic of farmer and then the content and, and the approach and the timing of the extension activities, um, you know, don't don't reach this broad group. And so we're repeating that with with digital tools. For example, if we're just focusing on smartphones and very few people have smartphones, then those who have smartphones, they already have better access to information and that's just going to increase. And so the gap in information access could deepen. Um, so that that's a key reason to be cautious. Um, so we truly need to understand and address social inclusion in ag advisory. And I think we mostly it's just like a couple of basic questions. So we need to think really carefully about who our farmer clients are and just think broadly about who they are, right? Rather than, you know, the, the lead farmer types that are often um, a focus of agricultural extension. And then the next thing is then we think about, okay, we understand who, who our audience is. 
um, and and now let's design and implement to reach them where they are right now, but also think about where they're heading to and and um, support information, access to agricultural information channels moving forward as well. Next slide, please. All right, so I said that there were three phases in um, in our little project, Atubandike. So the first one is design and prototyping and includes both the digital platform design as well as research design. The prototype that we developed though is, is this hybrid advisory system that I'll show in just a minute. So at this phase, um, we did we, we did some trying to get familiar with um, the digital ecosystem. And I said, again, there's this nice global review by Dittmer et al. I'm not one of the authors, by the way, but it is really, it's a, it's a very comprehensive review. Um, and then after looking at that, then we developed some social inclusion and agency enhancing criteria um, that we could use to look at, at different kinds of, of digital de, um, the um, digital extension tools. So for example, for social inclusion criteria, important things are affordability, infrastructure requirements. What about digital skills and literacy? Does it require people to be able to read or understand a particular language? And um, a fifth one, social inclusion criteria, it's not really social inclusion, but it's really about like, um, I mean, it is, but it's it's like making sure that the content is relevant to a broad audience. So you're going to have to have different content for different people because of the different needs and preferences. So that's social inc inclusion criteria, just five quick things that we thought of. And then for enhancing agency, you really have to make sure that what that your platform has high quality and new information. Um, so again, you're going to have to understand who your audience is and, and where they are right now. Um, you want to allow people to feed back. You want to hear from them and you want them to have that opportunity to ask questions, to share their farming experiences and knowledge. Um, you want peer-to-peer um, -peer networking. Can they talk to other peers through this, this um, platform? And, and trust is critical. And, and that's a key reason that we've gone hybrid because um, our research has shown that, you know, despite the, the many issues with in-person extension, there is some level of trust in agricultural extension officers on the part of farmers, at least in our survey area. Okay, I got a little off track, but so we, we've gone through the first two bullet points. Okay, so where we familiarized ourselves with the digital ecosystem, develop some criteria for, for ranking different kinds of advisory systems. Then we selected, so we selected a technology. You've probably seen that I have a bias to basic mobile phones. So we chose basic mobile phones and then interactive voice response because of the opportunity that provides for re reaching less literate folks. And then we, we entered into a partnership with a social enterprise um, company, Viamo, that has a lot of experience with reaching marginalized groups in um, digital, with digital information, digital-based information. And then finally, we, we sought to learn from some other IVR-based advisory platforms. So these are three that I, I really, really like um, and that we wanted to build on. So the first one, Keti, um, I think that's, um, that's the one to try and, um, and that's that's kind of where we we move from. Um, so this was a digital green. I don't know if it still exists. I've been trying to find out if it still exists. This is from I, I read about it in a in a journal article. So it's it's in a, India, and um, it's mobile phone IVR based. Um, it's nice because they they have a um, they they work with digital extension officers they're not they're not necessarily um, always on the ground but the digital extension officers um, so farmers can call in and they can ask questions and listen to content and they can provide feedback there isn't a possibility for them to network with peers on this platform but they can um, there there is the in person channel so they have these on the ground um, digital advisors that farmers can reach out to when they need help. 
Um, second is Avaj Otalo. That was a Berkeley and Stanford project in India. I don't think that exists anymore. Again, it's it's hard to find some of this information. This one, um, it allows for feedback opportunities and peer-to-peer -peer networking, but there's no in-person channels. It's it's all digital. And then Ushauri, this is a SIAT and Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute collaboration. That's um, a Tanzania um, platform. Um, it does allow feedback opportunities through the mobile phone um, IVR system, but there's no peer-to-peer -peer networking or in-person channels. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is a work in progress. I. I don't think that this is, um, I, I'm hoping that this can help kind of explain the, our, our prototype and platform. So let's start, if we start down where you see the farmer on a phone. So that's the starting point, okay. So a farmer that needs, um, you know, or is interested to um, participate in agricultural information channels, through their, their basic phone, they can call in to a platform. And so we have an arrow coming down from the database of IVR advisory content. So we have these three, 30 pre-recorded messages. And so a farmer can call in and listen to those three, 30 pre-recorded messages on climate smart agricultural practices. And then they can, um, there's an arrow that goes from the farmer up. They can ask questions about the content or, or anything related to the content. Um, and they can also share their own experiences. And they, they do that by you know, recording through their mobile phone. Then um, if you go from the cloud down to the right, you see this content committee. Okay, so one of our team members, Cleo, Cleo um, Kawanga, is um, co-leading this uh, a content committee where we have representation from farmers, uh, scientists and also from government, so the Ministry of Agriculture and also um, agricultural extension officers. So they meet and they um, they listen to the questions and they prioritize and they listen to the experiences, and then they they develop answers to the questions and they um, choose some selected experiences and those go back up to the cloud and then the farmers um, will get access to those um, in a it takes two weeks. So that's one of the key issues that I'm gonna bring up later on. So now if we go, so so we go back to the farmer and you know it would be great if that that were enough, but it 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 isn't to be socially inclusive. And so in we have communities getting involved. And so we we we've had so far um two um, designated community meetings, but we've been in the communities many other times for um, data collection and for trainings, et cetera. And so we've had these conversations with community members about the importance of inclusive access to agriculture information channels, how that benefits the whole community. And community members themselves have identified um, some of the, the drawbacks of of social exclusion in this context, and also solutions and actionable steps that they can take as a community. And so then they're providing, um, that's the plan, is for them to provide some support to the beneficiary farmers who will also share what they get from the platform with the wider community. Then in addition to the support from community members at the left, we have digital champions. So as I mentioned before, there are 84 digital champions, half of whom are, are women. And they're there to offer digital support um, because we did find that, um, that um, in our user tests that navigating the hotline, the platform is not as easy um, as it would seem. And so um, I also find it difficult to, to navigate through an IVR platform. So we have these digital champions that um, have become very familiar with the platform and they're there to support farmers. And they also, we, we've we um, trained them in some base, um, some agricultural advisory um, approaches and content. And so they will also act as um, 
um, semi-ag advisors. They're mainly there for digital support and also the project also hopes to empower them as leaders in their community um, because these are largely youth and, and women who are also often marginalized as holders of agricultural knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in addition to designing the hybrid platform, we've also, this phase one, also involved um, research design. And, and our research um, has uh, a participatory action research approach. Um, that's part of it. And with that, it's really, it's our baseline. Um, so we did several baseline data collection activities, including in-depth interviews, a baseline farmer survey. We had um, user testing sessions over several days, um, and we've had focus groups and community engagement in the communities. And the goal of this is to help us understand the context um, and also to involve farmers in multiple roles, right? As we're involving them as um, farmers um, who are part of the, the survey, but we're also involving them as digital champions, as testers of a digital tool, as co-developers of content, as well as the platform. And then all of that information then helps us to iterate to the rollout version of the platform. And then our second, um, the second part of our, our research design is um, we have an intervention. So we've rolled out um, Atubandike as a randomized control trial with five treatments. Um, next slide, please. So this, this slide shows our, um, our five treatments. Um, we do not have a peer control, um, and I can speak to that later if somebody wants um, has a question about that, because our goal was to compare different approaches to digital advisory rather than to control um, compare to um, a base of, of no digital advisory, because we, we feel that that doesn't exist, that people are already, um, it, it's pretty hard to, to find a peer control um, these days with the, the move towards um, digitalization of agriculture. So on the left, um, we see our first two treatments are purely digital, so they, they don't involve the in-person. So the first two treat treatments, T1 is what we're calling push. Um, it's, a, it's push advisory. And so that's where um, a farmer can call in and, and they can listen to the 30, um, 30 messages and they can listen eventually to um, talk shows where the, the questions that farmers ask are, um, are, are addressed and they can listen to farmer experiences, but they, they can't ask any questions. So they can just listen to content. Then T2, um, we, we add in the opportunity to um, give feedback, so bi-directional. So they see that, you know, their, the specific questions they have and their own experiences um, become part of the content. So they become originators, not just recipients of content in T2. Then T3, um, T3 through T5, we add in, it becomes hybrid. Okay, so we add in the in-person. So in T3, we engage 84 digital champions and they work as um, female male teams in the communities. And, and we provide them with just basic training and um, in digital skills, as well as some agricultural pr um, practices. Then T4 um, builds on T3, but, but here we're trying to promote um, gender inclusion in the DC's approach. And so we train them in um, gender diversity and inclusion. We've had one training so far and we're gonna be offering the second training next month. Then T5 is similar to T4 in that the goal there is to bring, um, to add in um, more social inclusion beyond us just targeting 50% women um, with the, the platform. But here we work through communities. So I talked about those community conversations where we talk about stereotypes that youth and women and the poor in their communities face and, and how that disadvantages them. And we, we um, support them in coming up with solutions. So those, those are our five um, treatments um, and they address different questions like T2 is, is asking um, 
you know, how important is it for people, farmers to be able to, to, to give feedback, to ask questions? How important is that in their participation and learning from an advisory, uh, um, agricultural advisory? And then the other ones ask questions about, you know, how important is in-person support and also um, how, what's, what are, you know, what works better? Is it better to train digital champions to promote social inclusion or um, engage with communities? All right, thank you. So next slide, please. All right, I don't know if I need to, I can probably come back to this if there are any questions. This was just a little more details about the digital champions, um, our, our treatment for, so next slide. And then this is um, some more details if anybody's interested later about our transformative community engagement or treatment five, and then we can go to, all right, phase two. And and I think I don't have that many more slides, um, like five or six. So sorry that I think I'm, I'm a little, I'm running a little bit behind. Um, so phase two, um, you know, once we had that, the prototype platform and we had our research design in place, then, we went to the participatory action research where we did the, I already mentioned the in-depth farmer interviews. Um, we had a baseline farmer survey um, and we we did these rigorous user testing sessions. We see a picture, a couple of pictures from those sessions at the bottom, middle and right. At right, this is one of the digital champions um, who came to the training with her mom so that she could um, have her mom helped take care of baby while she was at the session. Um, finally, the community engagement meetings at bottom left, we see that there is quite a bit of engagement um, as you see by the women hold, um, with their hands up. Men are there too, but there does tend to be quite a bit of segregation on gender um, in these community meetings. All right, next slide, please. I, so, so this slide, I don't really need to go into very much. It's just kind of showing that one of the things that we did in order to, we wanted to see, have in our sample, not just the typical um, household members. So, so generally, if you do um, um, intra-household interviewing, you'll usually, so oftentimes we'll include a spouse, um, the household head and spouse, but we wanted to hear from other kinds of household members like, like children and parents. So we allowed, um, so we, we randomly selected from a list that included the, the top three, the three primary farmers in a household. What we did find is that that led to about, um, I guess it would be about 5% of our sample or 10% of our sample being um, non-spouses and non-heads. Um, but yeah, it, I think we we appreciated having those the youth as part of our sample. All right, offering a new perspective. Next slide, please. I'm so basically from the baseline survey, we have four key findings, and I'm not going to read all of these quotes. They're just there um, to highlight some some messages. But the key one of the key things we found is that there's a lot of interest. So the farmers that we talk to, they have a lot of interest in mobile phone based advisory. They see a lot of advantages to it. There also was a lot of interest in our specific platform and people talked about some of the advantages that they could see. They also talked about some of the problems and we've um, used that to, to learn and revise. Um, so, so one of the things people talked about is that it's just it's convenient to to use their phone. It, it saves them time and they can be updated quickly. They don't have to waste time walking and hanging around at a meeting. And then people talked about they like to be able to to listen to messages um, on a, any phone and in their the language they're most familiar with. And they, they really like to be able to ask questions and hear voices of, of females as well as males, not um, so that, that's another advantage of digital is that we can use a very broad, uh, we can use voices of youth, elderly, females and males um, and different people like um, we farmers as well as extension officers and ag scientists. All right, next slide. All right, Monica, so. Monica, uh -huh. sorry. 
Um, could you, I don't know, I'm very sorry because it's a very interesting presentation, but um, in the interest of time, could you try to wrap it up uh, in the next couple of minutes? Uh, so we have some time for for the discussion and also for general Q&A. Because I think the session ends at five, so we have 20 minutes left um, in total. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no problem. I think I... <laughs> I think I'm taking longer than I had anticipated, but it, I think I probably have about four more minutes um, because most of what we have is is at the early stages. We don't have a lot in terms of results. So again, from the baseline survey, so we found a lot of interest, but then readiness for um, mobile phone advisory is low. So what we found though, is that there's a lot of diversity, right? So these are two, two farmers um, in our sample or in our intervention. We have one farmer at the you know left. Um, so she's one end of the spectrum. That's somebody who she doesn't, she didn't have a phone to begin with, but we're helping her get access or the community's helping her get access. She has low digital trust and she can't read. Then we have somebody else on the other end of the spectrum, this young single farmer. He has a smartphone, high digital trust, and he's he's more educated. So um, generally, we found readiness is low. The person on the, the the man on the right, he's kind of an exception to the rule. Uh, so next slide, please. And then, in addition to readiness, there are a lot of social perceptions that are create that can create barriers to inclusive mobile phone or any kind of advisory, because the community conversations reveal gender norms that create challenges to reaching and benefiting women with advisory. So for example, people talked about how the community perceives men as the real farmers and they're, they're considered heads of household. And sometimes women need to get per permission to go to meetings or probably to use their phone to call into an advisory service. Youth also face very um, demoral, demotivating stereotypes such as some people um, mentioned that young men prefer roadside jobs and alcohol, while young women are often seen with their boyfriends instead of working in the fields. So that's something to address as well. Next slide, please. Um, but on an encouraging note, farmers also expressed interest to support inclusive mobile phone advisory. And so people talked a lot about, um, they had really creative, um, enthusiastic ideas for, for how we can promote inclusiveness that we are trying to take up in the project. Um, next slide, please. So just quickly, some of the lessons that we've used. Um, so we, I'll just mention one of them has to do with digital tools. What we really think that it's important to use the tools that farmers have now because we saw very low, less than 2% had smartphones, but so we need to use basic phones as we're doing, but also to include options for smartphone applications for, for people um, as they become more familiarized and as they, um, yeah, if they, if they want to, to go beyond what we have. And then a second one is digital champions. They're motivated, but they need incentives and support. So we're trying to find ways to do that. And they're also, they're playing a really important role in helping us to overcome some of the shortcomings of the digital platform. Finally, we've we've found the the regular engagement with communities to be really important to promote social inclusion in our project. I think next slide, and I think this is the last one. Yes, so this is my last slide. Thanks everyone for um, hanging in there. Um, so we we also in in twenty twenty five we're going to have midline end line surveys with farmers, and we're also going to have digital champion surveys. And um, some of the key research questions that we're going to address with the data. One of them is which kinds of interventions are most effective at narrowing gender gaps in digital advisory participation and learning. We also are going to compare some of the digital modes of communication. We need to be thinking about business models to promote sustainability of the system because some of the projects that we've um, that we find as exemplary, unfortunately, have not. The platforms disappeared once the project funding ended. And finally, um, we hope to be part of a dialogue that's happening in the CGIR to identify key indicators of inclusive digital technology and how we can, in a standardized way, measure digital inclusion. Thank you very much, everyone.
Thank you very much, Monica. Very nice, interesting presentation. Huh? Thank you. I would hand it over to, to Agnes, please, for your intervention. Thank you. Great. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for this um, fascinating um, presentation, Monica. I mean, I could, I, I really could have gone on and on listening. It's, I'm very curious to see what you're going to find out once you do your your midline and uh, an endline survey. So um, just a very quick point so that um, the rest of the group can chime in. Um, one is that I really like your design. It's very nice to see you try to unbundle this package because Obviously, with limited resources, we want to find out which combination of features works best for digital extension. Um, I was just wondering whether you are able to control for the possibility of spillovers. I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing in real life, but um, it could confound the interpretation of your results. Um, I was going to ask you about whether all women have equal access to mobile phones. And I think you addressed this when you talked about um, the readiness of people for digital advisory. So you obviously have to overcome those barriers of access. Um, so this is more like thinking about what might come out of your study down the line. I would be very curious to see what type of digital champions are most effective for which audience, for which audience. And I don't think this you can do um, quantitatively necessarily because you'd have to have an enormous sample size. But this is something that might be nice to explore using qualitative work, whether um, women or youth or whatever type of person is an effective digital champion. Um, one of the things that I really liked in 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 your approach is that you also have this um, scope to build trust in extension agents. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of um, digital learning platforms that you're just interacting with. Who knows? It's Maybe it's AI, who knows? It's a real person, but it's nice to be mm -hmm. able to connect to a real person that you see in your community. So, um, so two more points and very quickly. One is that I see the advantage of the digital platform in convenience, um, in having diverse voices, but I also see a possible trade-off in terms of building community. And I wonder whether um, the design can have a feature where you can build up community. Um, I have no idea in what ways you would. And the last question I have is whether um, you have um, nudges for people to call in. So my experience being part of a digital learning platform is, is that I can be also very, um, I can shirk my language lessons, for example, then I get these irritating nudges. So mm -hmm. are there things like that to sort of keep interest up as, as the program goes on? That's all. Thank you very much. This is fascinating. Over back to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Agnes. Very interesting points. And I second uh, your comment, your very first comment on the it's very comprehensive uh, assessment that you're undertaking there, Monica and team. Huh? Very impressive. So would you want to react to some of Agnes' comments, Monica? Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you so much, Agnes. These are um, really valuable um, questions and comments. So I let me just speak to them one by one. Um, so you asked about the um, if we control for the possibility of spillovers um, in use of the platform and also um, awareness and knowledge. And that's, so that's something that we've tried to do. One way is that only certain people can call, have access, to, can call in to the platform. So that's one way. And then the other thing is we randomized at the, um, I get the, um, it's called a, a, a an agricultural camp, which is a collection of communities. And so that's, that's how we've tried to address possible spillovers. And then as far as whether all women have access to mobile phones, so it was something like it, it varies a lot by their um, poverty level and gender, as well as age. And what we found is it, it varied from about 70 percent. I think that was lower income females to like 90 something, 98 percent of well off um, men. Um, and so what we were trying to do is get people access through these community conversations and the digital champions where, okay, you got in your family, the person who got selected was um, your spouse, right? 
that's going to benefit your family. Your spouse doesn't have the phone. So can your spouse use the phone? And you can even listen to it together. I mean, these are some of the things that the community members came up with. So that's how we're trying to help with access. Then I really like your question about the digital champions, right? I, and, and I agree that should be, we could use qualitative focus groups and in-depth interviews to find out like, you know, what methods and, and which, you know, what are the characteristics of the digital champions that are most effective for reaching um, different types of, of, of audiences, women, men, youth, et cetera. So I'm um, thank you for sharing that. I, that's I think that we're going to add that to our our list of questions. Um, you, I'm hoping I'm if I miss something, please let me know. I agree about the the trade offs. Um, and so there, what we're trying to do is we're the digital champions are being um, um, part of their job is not just to engage with the farmers they're assigned to. Um, but they're also supposed to hold community forums where they share with the whole community um, the information from our platform. And then the nudges, that's really important to keep the interest up. And so there are going to be SMS nudges, but um, I guess I don't trust those as much with this particular audience. But so what, because but we're going to have the digital champions are going to be nudging. They're going regularly. And then we're going to be we're going to have a presence in the communities, too, because we're going to be going to collect personal testimonials and talk to farmers. So I think um, that's one of the way we'll nudge and keep the, it relevant and in people's minds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, yeah. If, uh, I would like to open the floor now to to all colleagues for for questions and uh, comments, suggestions, and I see there's one in the chat already. Vera, if you like, can you unmute yourself? Do you have, uh, can you speak? Then please go uh, ahead. Yeah, I'll just uh, go over my question. Thank you so much. Your presentation was great. Um, I've worked in Zambia, so I could really put a lot of visuals to <laughs> what you were describing. Um, and so my first question is if you have initial thoughts on which business models would make this platform self-sustaining, and then I was really curious about the RCT design and if you're monitoring for agronomic indicators of success. Thank you. Very good questions, Vera. The first one was also on my mind. Please, Monica, tell us how you will solve these issues. All right. The the second question is a little bit easier. <laughs> so the 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 RCT design, yeah, we do have so our outcome variables there. So at the midline, we're going to be asking about participation, um, and and also we're going to we um, look at learning because we asked we had an awareness and knowledge of CSA practices module, and so we'll we'll revisit that, and then at end line we will be looking at um, uh, trust in in the platform, which is not agronomic, but we will also probably be looking at. Um, uptake or at least intent to uptake because we don't have um it, it takes a lot of time for farmers to to learn and then try out and adopt but we're going to we will probably include that as, among our indicators or our outcome variables and then your other question is a harder one and that's something that we're trying to figure out now so we can look to the digital ecosystem for some examples unfortunately there are a lot of projects that disappear like after funding ends so one of them ushauri this um it's a um also mobile phone ivr platform it's in tanzania and i think they're exemplary because they're working with the government so the government has adopted them as part of that platform as part of its um advisory um, policy or, or platform. So that's something that through this content committee, that's one of the things we, we have government representation and we're hoping to um, build a relationship and hopefully um, to convince them that this is something valuable as well as learn from them. Um, and then we also, since we're working with Fiamo and um, it's a, they're a, it's a social enterprise, it's, it's, it's a business. Um, and so we're we're trying to think also of like um, private sector partnerships, but 
to be honest, this is something because we we just rolled out last month. So we this is something we should we need to be thinking about now. And um, it's good to to for us to to continue. If you have any ideas on that, it would be much appreciated. It's something on our agenda, but not something that we have um, any solid plan for at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Colleagues, are there more questions? Please raise your hand or unmute yourself if you have any comments or suggestions. Yeah, I guess this. Ah, Maureen, please. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Monica, for this extremely interesting uh, presentation and piece of work. And, um, you know, the thoughts that have been shared by uh, Agnes as well as, um, you know, Vera. I had the same uh, a question on the um, uh, on the champions uh, because they're going to be critical in taking uh, this forward and um, just seeing that how many do we have that are youth, male, female, um, uh, women because we know women's uh, preference for uh, for female uh, extension service workers. We can uh, discuss this later, but I really would like to know the um, for treatment for uh, the GDI. Um, uh, parameters that you use, uh, you know, for training as well as five on the transformative ones. I think we can um, we can uh, we can we can discuss that later, and I can also share a very similar intervention we just began um, uh, with Kusa, who are another platform, um, you know, just like uh, Viamo, and uh, trying to work around the sustainability of it. Um, it. It's good, of course, to have the private sector involved. Uh, but also to get other uh, incentives and add-ons, as Agnes suggested, that keep farmers interested and that they might be willing to sustain, um, you know, the platform uh, themselves because of the value they see from it. I know from lower tech uh, options as the talking book, uh, farmers are quite willing to buy the batteries themselves uh, and just keep it going. And because they saw all the advantages of, of course, accessing extension services and having some difficult uh, conversations around gender and social norms within the household. So once uh, the value is clearly created, uh, you know, for, for, for farmers, um, we um, probably should be discussing how the, these additional benefits uh, on it um, uh, that can, can interest them in holding uh, the platform beyond the project uh, period. So I'm not sure if it's a question I have or just <laughs> comment on it, but it's very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Maureen. No, it's great to have, get this conversation started with you and welcome to 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 Simit. Uh, um, thank you for participating. I want, I'm really keen to hear more about KUSA. I had not heard about that. Um, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I should should have, but um, so I'd, I'm very interested to hear about KUSA and also talk with you more about T4 and T5 um, and how we can um, get your ideas about how we can um, make the the platform more impactful um, to a, a broader group of people and how we we might engage better with the digital champions and begin some working relationships with private sector actors. So I appreciate that. And I look forward to um, talking with you more about these, these issues. Thank you. So colleagues, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry, but for in the interest of time, um, we have to stop now. Thanks again, uh, Monica, for your presentation. It's a very interesting topic. And, and you see, I think there's a lot of interest in uh, we would like to see how this is coming out. And we wish you all the best, of course. And thank you, Agnes, for, as usual, for very nice uh, and very pointed inputs. Um, it seems like we can throw any topic at you and you are ready to uh, <laughs> to give no, really no, good... No, 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 that's not true. <laughs> well, so far, you've done a great job. <laughs> And thank mm -hmm. you, everybody, for joining us. We'll have our next session in a month time, the last Thursday of each month. Uh, we may adjust the time, but you will be notified. Uh, will be always the last Thursday of the month. Presenter and topic uh, will be announced very soon. Thank you all for joining and wish you a, a nice evening, day, afternoon, um, yeah, and a good weekend then soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.